Hello, I'm Kaser, and welcome to Moose Reads. Before I get started, I want to say that the opinions that I give here are my own opinions. They are extremely subjective. If I dislike a book, it is not a reflection on the author, and it is not a reflection on people who do like it. Different people have different tastes, and that's okay. Today, I will be doing my November wrap-up. I'm not entirely sure there's much point to this, given that a full review for each of these books is already posted on my channel, but maybe this is a preferred format for some of you, so I'll go through it anyway. I read 11 books in November, and DNF'd two. Last time I listed them all before going through each of them, but I think that's probably unnecessary. They are all shown in the thumbnail, so you should have a good idea of what you're in for. If you prefer that format, though, leave a comment and let me know. At any rate, the first three books I read were books two through four in my own series, The Bond and the Breaking. The tentative titles for those are Life and Death, Love and Loss, and Hope and Fear. That's all I'm going to say about them, though, because nobody can read them yet, and each book is a spoiler for the one before it. As for books that are not mine, the first one I read was Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. It is a queer contemporary romance. The description says... When his mother became president, Alex Claremont Diaz was promptly cast as the American equivalent of a young royal. Handsome, charismatic, genius, his image is pure millennial marketing gold for the White House. There's only one problem. Alex has a beef with the actual prince, Henry, across the pond. And when the tabloids get hold of a photo involving an Alex-Henry altercation, U.S.-British relations take a turn for the worse. Heads of family, state, and other handlers devise a plan for damage control, staging a truce between the two rivals. What at first begins as a fake, Instagrammable friendship grows deeper and more dangerous than either Alex or Henry could have imagined. Soon, Alex finds himself hurtling into a secret romance with a surprisingly unstuffy Henry that could derail the campaign and upend two nations, and begs the question, can love save the world after all? Where do we find the courage and the power to be the people we are meant to be, and how can we learn to let our true colors shine through? Casey McQuiston's Red, White, and Royal Blue proves true love isn't always diplomatic. I gave this book three stars. I was pretty neutral toward it, despite the fact that it had a lot of elements that usually make me like books more. It wasn't a bad book by any means, it just wasn't the book for me. Certainly, if you like queer romance, I would probably still recommend giving this one a shot. There were several things I did like about this book. I liked the banter between Alex and Henry, and I absolutely loved the love letters they exchanged in the form of emails. I also really enjoyed that this is one of few romances I've read that has a very strong supporting cast. But I think the reason this book landed a bit flat for me was because of three elements. First, I couldn't really relate to the main characters. Both Alex and Henry are famous and extremely driven young men intent on bettering the world. I am not particularly driven, and I'm definitely not famous, so many of their struggles were just entirely alien to me. They both also struggle with trying to meet expectations, but because Alex's expectations are almost entirely self-imposed and Henry is not a POV character, I couldn't relate very well to either of them in that aspect either. Second, I didn't feel like they had a very good partnership. The specifics of this involve a lot of spoilers, but a large part of it is that they live in different countries in different time zones, so a lot of the book involves them trying to figure out ways to just be in the same place together, which makes it hard to develop them very well as partners. I also felt like Alex carried a lot more weight in trying to make the relationship work, and that he wasn't very good at standing up for Henry when he needed support. And then third, this book had two and a half third act twists, and I felt that was entirely too many. Generally, I wouldn't recommend a romance author attempting more than one third act twist, but I will admit that I think this wouldn't have been a problem with just the first and last twist. The middle twist was smaller and almost the exact same as the final twist, and I felt like it was both unnecessary and undercut the final twist. 
You will note that those are all extremely subjective opinions. The third one is closest to an objective critique on the writing and story, and even it is very much a matter of opinion. I know a lot of people really like this book, which doesn't really surprise me. If you think these things would hamper your enjoyment as much as they did mine, I'd recommend giving this a pass. If you don't think those are problems, absolutely give it a shot. Next, I tried to read The Hero Interviews by Andy Ewington. This is a fantasy comedy. The description says, Heroes. You can't swing a cat without hitting one. You can't even hatch a nefarious plan without some adventuring party invading your dungeon to thwart you. So it stands to reason they're a force for good, right? Well, yes and no. Elburn Barr is a lore master who has turned his back on his family's tradition of adventuring and stepped out into the realm of heroes to interview a whole smorgasbord of fantastical characters from stoic, swear-shy paladins through to invisible, sword-carrying mime warriors. Through his transcribed journal, he'll take a cheeky peek at the truth lurking behind the hero myth and everything associated with them. Across his many encounters, he hopes to uncover his brother's fate, a brother who has been missing for ten summers after brazenly setting out to forge a heroic name for himself. Will Elburn discover what really happened to his brother, or will he fail in his quest and become another casualty of the adventuring trade? The hero interviews is a departure from the usual swords and sorcery yarn. It's a sometimes gritty, sometimes amusing, but completely bonkers look at the realm of heroes. I don't remember for sure how I heard about this one, but I thought it sounded kind of fun. I did not enjoy it at all, and DNF'd it after the third chapter. It's worth noting that I am very rarely a comedy person, so it is entirely possible this book is perfectly fine and just not for me. The biggest issue I had with this book, which made it abundantly clear that I was not going to enjoy myself from the first page, was the egregious use of footnotes. There are so many of these, and they are almost entirely pointless. Most of the time, they just took me away from what was happening to tell me a joke that I didn't think was funny. I'm not saying footnotes can't be funny. I've only ever encountered them once before this book, and that was in Good Omens, where I thought they were utilized quite well. But the key to making them work is a combination of pseudo-necessity and pointed placement. There are 59 footnotes in Good Omens. There are 66 in the first three chapters of the hero interviews. Second, Ewington persists in jokes that I just don't think are funny. There were multiple fireball jokes in the first few chapters, and not a single one of them landed for me. Especially the one in the footnote. But I can acknowledge that humor is extremely subjective. One of the ten blurbs on this book's Amazon description says they loved the fireball jokes, so clearly there is an audience for this. I'm just not it. I also just didn't think it was very well written. Even setting aside the footnotes, which I'm pretty sure you can, it just wasn't very good. The main character is ostensibly searching for his missing brother, but if that becomes a plot point, it takes a while to start going. Or I think it does. In chapter 3, he interviews a wizard who accidentally murdered his entire party save one member. The protagonist expresses surprise to hear this party member's name, but by the time I got there, with all the asides from the footnotes and the general lack of structure, I couldn't remember if that was supposed to be his brother or just some famous adventurer. And he doesn't make this clear in the chapter either. I just looked it up, and his brother is named Aldon, and the random hero is called Aaron. So it wasn't his brother, but I'm not gonna beat myself up for not being sure. Going back to the humor for a moment, I felt it was very callous. The first interview is with a barbarian who is very unlike your typical barbarian, and it becomes clear in the course of the interview that the Hero Guild recruited him so that they could convince him to sign over his fortune in the event of his death, and then send him out to die. This is extremely obvious, but our protagonist neither remarks on it nor gives any indication that he cares. Certainly, he takes no steps to either warn the barbarian or prevent this from happening to others. In the third chapter, as I said, the wizard accidentally murdered his entire party. 
with a fireball. So that should serve as an indicator of how well the fireball jokes land. And that is a joke. The book very much seems to think it's funny that this guy accidentally burned his comrades to death because he was careless. Again, your mileage may vary, but I just don't find the casual disregard for life all that funny. I know they're not real people, but if the humor hinges on me acknowledging that fact, you've already failed in your storytelling. With so many major strikes in the first three chapters, I decided it wasn't worth my time. I wouldn't recommend this book. However, if you think I'm being unfair, you can read the first seven chapters for free on Amazon using this sneak peek and decide for yourself. Next, I read Escaping the Duke by Melanie Rose Clark. This is a straight Regency romance. The description says, Priscilla Livingston has dedicated her life to social causes, fighting to right the cruel injustices the world ignores. Under the guise of a lord, she sends messages to Edmund Hawkins, the powerful Duke of Bradenton. He doesn't know his informant is a lady, even as he investigates to uncover her identity. When her father demands she find a husband, she cannot choose Edmund, who would demand total surrender. But when he catches her spying, she may not have a choice. Edmund is intrigued by the beautiful lady he caught snooping through a dangerous lord's home. Lady Priscilla may act the perfect duke's daughter, but fiery mystery burns beneath the flawless facade. He sees the passion she cannot hide, the spirited woman who would make the perfect duchess. He will discover her every secret. Then he will make her his. I gave this book two stars. I did not like it at all. I very nearly DNF'd it early on, and I honestly wish I had trusted that instinct. So, it's important to note that Regency Romance has several major pitfalls that it is easy to fall into. The biggest one has to do with the fact that women were basically property in the era, belonging first to their father and then to their husband. It is vitally important for my enjoyment of a Regency romance that the male lead make it abundantly clear that he does not view the woman in this way and will not force anything upon her as part of his marital rights. Based on the description, I thought this book would avoid that pitfall. Priscilla is described with very feminist overtones, and I didn't think she was likely to submit to a husband who would treat her as a possession. Unfortunately, I was wrong. From the very beginning, Priscilla makes it clear that she is not interested in Edmund, and he continues to pursue her anyway because he's interested in her, and he always gets what he wants. Beginning from the first official outing of their courtship, he orders her around and asserts his control over her as if they are already married. It was a very unpleasant book. I only kept reading it because I thought he might learn his lesson over the course of the book. Clark certainly wanted me to believe that, taking pains in his POV chapters to say he's not really that overbearing and would never actually restrict his wife, but this is a complete lie. The book repeatedly shows me that Edmund is a tyrant who thinks he owns Priscilla simply because he wants her. It doesn't matter how often Clark tells me he isn't, I won't be convinced. So yeah, I don't recommend this book. After that, I read Remnants of Filth Volume 1 by Robao Buchiro. This is a Chinese queer martial arts fantasy. The description says, Noble-born Mo Ji is the foremost general of Changhua, known for his ruthless temper and ascetic air. Once he was one of two promising young commanders, twin stars of the empire. His comrade, the low-born Gu Mong, was Mo Ji's brother-in-arms, best friend, and, secretly, his lover. Until the day Gu Mong turned traitor and joined the ranks of their nation's greatest enemy. Now, Gu Mong has been returned to the Empire a ruined man, a shadow of the military genius he once was. The public clamors for his death, and no one yearns for vengeance more than Mo Ji. Or so he thought, for faced once more with his bitterest enemy, Mo Ji is left with more questions than answers. Why did the man he loved betray him, and what secrets hide behind Gu Mong's tortured eyes? I gave this one four stars. I liked it a lot. That being said, it should have come with some heavy content warnings. This book contains slavery, abuse, torture, sexual slavery, and threats of rape. Gu Mong was born a slave, and several chapters involve him being abused by his master. 
Additionally, when he is returned to Changhua, he is returned to his former master to be punished as he sees fit, so long as he is not killed. The punishment he decides on is to place Gu Mong in a brothel where anyone can do whatever they want to him. This includes rape, but because of magic shenanigans, he is protected from that fate. Still, the threat is there, and we sit with it for a while before we are told it can't actually happen. And he is still violently abused. The main draw for me in this book was the romance, though, and Moji does not participate in any of that. He's very hurt by Gu Mong's betrayal, rightly so, but because he's been in love with him for so long, he doesn't know how to move on without answers as to why it happened. And since Gu Mong is in no condition to give him answers, he's going to spend a lot of time with very complicated feelings. I enjoyed that part a lot. This one is pretty heavy, so while I did like it, I would definitely recommend using caution before giving it a read. If the content warnings aren't going to cause you trouble, and the emotional turmoil Moji faces sounds appealing to you, definitely give it a try. Next, I read The Love Interest by Kale Dietrich. This is a queer romance. I think it might also technically be a thriller, but I'm not sure. The description says, There is a secret organization that cultivates teenage spies. The agents are called love interests because getting close to people destined for great power means getting valuable secrets. Caden is a nice, the boy next door, sculpted to physical perfection. Dylan is a bad, the brooding, dark-souled guy, and dangerously handsome. The girl they are competing for is important to the organization, and each boy will pursue her. Will she choose a nice or the bad? Both Caden and Dylan are living in the outside world for the first time. They are well-trained and at the top of their games. They have to be. Whoever the girl doesn't choose will die. What the boys don't expect are feelings that are outside of their training. Feelings that could kill them both. I gave this book three stars. I was very invested at the beginning, but the further into the book I got, the less impressed I was by the story. One of the biggest problems is that the romance is pretty weak. The two boys are competing throughout most of the book, and there isn't much room for them to spend time together. It worked okay, but it could have been better, and some stuff at the end of this book made me like it a lot less. The story around the two boys is also pretty weak. It's single perspective, so we don't get to see a whole lot of Dylan trying to seduce Juliet. Without seeing his efforts against Caden, he never really feels like much of a threat. At the end, when the characters have to overcome the evil organization, they don't come off as competent enough to do so. The ending, therefore, feels quite forced. It also doesn't have very much room to breathe, so it feels very rushed as well. Overall, the book was fine, but I wouldn't recommend reading it. Next, I read Vampire Hunter D, Razor of Gales by Hideyuki Kikuchi. This one is a Japanese paranormal fantasy sci-fi. The description says, Vampires, murderous creatures in the shape of humans. They stalk of the night, feeding on the blood of innocents. Seemingly immortal, they can be destroyed only by the use of a stake through the heart, severing of their heads, or exposure to sunlight. By the year 12,090 AD, vampires have ruled the earth for almost 300 years, and it is only these weaknesses that have kept these foul monsters from totally overrunning the world. But what happens when those rules no longer apply? The village of Tsepesh sits in the eternal shadow of an abandoned castle, a one-time stronghold of the nobility, the vampire lords who ruled the devastated wasteland of the future. Ten years ago, four children disappeared while playing near the castle, only to mysteriously reappear a month later. Now vampires have begun to hunt in the daylight. Are the two events connected? The villagers turn to the vampire hunter known only as D, but as he follows the children, now adults, the answers he finds may be more terrifying than anything he could ever imagine. One star, do not recommend. I bought about half the Vampire Hunter D series around high school because I'd watched and enjoyed the anime movies and thought I would enjoy the books. I only ever read about four of them back then, and now that I'm reading again, I wanted to try to get through them. I read the first book again in September before I started this channel, and I did not enjoy it. There was some uncomfortable sexism sprinkled throughout the book, and it was pretty hard to get past. 
but I thought it might have been a fluke since I didn't remember it being an issue, so I decided I would read at least one more. Turns out it wasn't a fluke. I'm not a feminist crusader by any stretch. I don't have the energy to be. But I was exposed to feminism between my first read of these books and my second. And it's a lot harder for me to enjoy media that doesn't think I'm a person. Vampire Hunter D very much falls into that category. Nearly any time a woman is mentioned in this book, it is as a sexual object. The author will, almost without fail, mention some aspect of the woman's body in a sexual way or reference how much someone would or does want to fuck her. It is extremely uncomfortable. More so because the primary character in this book besides Dee is a 17-year-old girl. There's also multiple scenes of rape and sexual assault in this book. There's a lot more to say about this book, but I'm going to leave it at that here. If you want to hear more of my thoughts, feel free to check out the full review. As far as I'm concerned, these books are terrible, and I don't recommend them. After that, I read Scarlet and the White Wolf by Kirby Crow. This is a queer fantasy romance. The description says, Scarlet of Lycia is an honest peddler, a young merchant traveling the wild, undefended road to support his aging parents. Lial, called the Wolf of Omara, is the handsome, world-weary chieftain of a tribe of bandits blocking a mountain road that Scarlet needs to cross. When Lial jokingly demands a carnal toll for the privilege, Scarlet refuses, and an inventive battle of wills ensues, with disastrous results. Scarlet is convinced that Lial is a worthless, immoral rogue. But when the hostile countryside explodes into violence and Leal unexpectedly fights to save the lives of Scarlet's family, Scarlet is forced to admit that the wolf is not the worst ally he could have. But what price will proud Scarlet ultimately have to pay for Leal's friendship? I gave this four stars. I enjoyed it. But this one also comes with a bit of a content warning. Because of the nature of Leal's advances and his position as a bandit leader, Scarlet sometimes perceives his interest as possible threats of rape. There are also a couple of scenes that sound like they might be threats of rape, although the intentions are a bit unclear. I swear I don't search out books with these themes. I think this is just a common issue with fantasy romance. At any rate, the interplay between the two characters is good. Even though Scarlet feels threatened by Leal, because the book is dual perspective, we as the audience know he is never in any danger from him. And given that their interactions make up the bulk of this book, enjoying them meant I enjoyed reading it. There's not much else to say about this. It's a good book, but not a lot happens in it. I would possibly recommend this, but I can't do so enthusiastically because it is the first in a five book series and, well, eventually it goes a little bit downhill. Naturally, I followed up Scarlet and the White Wolf with the second book in the series, Mariner's Luck. I'm going to go ahead and read the synopsis. I don't think it constitutes spoilers for the first book per se, but if you don't want to risk it, the rest of the books I've read this month are books in the series. So you can go ahead and pause the video or close it out. For everyone else, the description says, Scarlet the Peddler and Leal the Bandit find themselves among hostile company aboard a Roshani brigantine headed north through icy waters. Leal has been summoned home to Roshan na Ostra by way of a cryptic message, and Scarlet, after a near-fatal encounter with bounty hunters seeking Leal's head, recklessly follows Leal into danger. Now, the unlikely pair, an honorable Hiluran and a giant northern rogue, are relentlessly pursued over rough seas on a perilous journey for Leal to reclaim his past. But what new dangers await them in the fabled land of night? I also gave this book four stars, although it had a lot more elements I didn't enjoy. This one also comes with a content warning for rape, so again, if that's a problem for you, this is not your series. The book takes place almost entirely on board the ship taking them to Rajan. Mostly, it has the sorts of things you'd expect in a book about a voyage across the sea. Scarlet has never sailed and has to contend with seasickness, the Rashani are deeply xenophobic and dislike him, and there is a battle at sea. Mostly, what I didn't like about this book was that Lial was in a very bad mood the whole time, what with having to return home to face his sordid past, and so he was quick to argue with Scarlet. Multiple times he calls him a child or tells him to stop acting like one, 
which would normally be fine, but becomes kind of uncomfortable given that the Roshani age much slower and live much longer than normal people. I tolerate supernatural or fantasy species age gaps, but I don't like to be bluntly reminded of the gap. This also suffered a bit in the writing. Scarlet either thought or said the same thing repeatedly, and it very much felt like Crow wrote the book without going back to review the flow and didn't realize she'd written the same scene more than once. It wasn't so bad I couldn't get past it, but it really ought to have been cleaned up in the editing. All in all, I felt mostly the same about this book as I did the first one, and was fully prepared to read on in the series. Which brings us to The Land of Night. Struggling to come to terms with his new life in Roshan Naostra, young Scarlet is trying to find his place in a decadent, foreign society that bears an ancient hatred for all Hiluran. As Lial is pulled away from Scarlet and into the jaded intrigues of a royal court, the young peddler wonders if they've made a terrible mistake in journeying to Roshan. Each passing day, Lial seems more like a stranger, more like one of the haughty Rishani nobility and less like the bandit leader Scarlet knew in Byzantor. As Lial contends with the aristocracy to uphold his 14-year-old brother's claim to the throne, an infinitely more dangerous enemy draws nearer, determined to part the lovers forever. I gave this one another four stars. I almost DNF'd it because the problems I had with Mariner's Luck carried over into the beginning, but just before I could get fully fed up with it, it got much better. I will say this one was poorly edited, with extra missing or transposed words in several sentences throughout that made the reading experience less enjoyable. It did, however, have more plot than the previous two entries in the series. While I did enjoy this book quite a bit, there were also several things that irritated me. These were both minor and major irritations. Unfortunately, they are pretty much all spoilers, so if you want to know more specific thoughts, please go watch my full review. But having finished book three in the series, I then moved on to book four, The King of Forever. The description says, The sun has returned to the land of night, and Leol has claimed a throne he never wanted, but many still oppose the presence of his beloved Scarlet at court. While the powerful barons clamor for a royal heir to secure the succession, rumors fly of Lial's marriage to a baron's daughter, driving a painful wedge between the lovers. But the proposed marriage of Lady Rasilka isn't the only reason Scarlet has grown distant. His magic is changing, mutating into a dangerous power he does not understand, and the only people who might be able to help him control it are the ancients, who once tried to murder him. When the borders of Rashan are threatened, and war looms, Lial agrees to a forbidden pact to save Scarlet, but the bargain may cost the wolf his life. I got 17% of the way through this one before I DNF'd it. It was written a full eight years after The Land of Night, and it seemed to me that Crow had forgotten a lot of the details she had written in her story. There's a certain point where I'm not willing to keep reading if it's clear to me that the author doesn't care enough to make sure they get it right. And I hit that point really quickly with this book. I honestly hit it quite a bit before the 17% mark, but kept going hoping that it would be one or two small things I could overlook. They kept piling up, however, and I gave up. That was all the books I read, or tried to read, in November. If you'd like to hear more about my thoughts on any of the 12 I finished, there are full reviews posted on my channel. If you liked this video, I hope you'll watch more in the future. Thanks for watching this one. Bye!